Hello, my name is Kyle Clarich and I'm a cardiologist in the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, Division of Structural Heart Disease and Cardiovascular Ultrasound at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. You are listening to Interviews with the Experts series. And today it is my great pleasure to have with us Dr. Jeremy Thaden from the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, Division of Structural Heart Disease and Cardiovascular Ultrasound, also from the Mayo Clinic Rochester campus. And he is here today to help us with the expert topic about transthoracic echocardiographic guidance of minimally invasive approaches to transcatheter aortic valve implantation and replacement. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Clinch. Um, I, I think it'd be fun to just go back and kind of reminisce a little bit about how echo has changed the role of echocardiography in terms of the guidance of transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TADI or TAVR as we now call it. How has this changed over time and what have you seen in your uh, wealth of experience? Yeah, thank you. So it, it is kind of amazing how the procedure has evolved over the last seven to 10 years. I mean, initially these were all done um, essentially in a hybrid OR with an intubated patient and transesophageal echo guidance. That was our first, that was probably about our first five to six years of experience actually was all general sedation, uh, transesophageal echo guidance. Um, and then about uh, around three to four years ago, uh, we switched to transthoracic echo guidance for the majority of our cases. Um, and really, this was mostly, this is all for the transfemoral patients. So for alternative access is a little different. So patients where there's a transapical, transaortic, transaxillary, transcoronal, all those alternative access bucket, those are still guided by transesophageal echo. But I think the way the devices have, have evolved with smaller um, access sheaths, um, really the majority of our patients are transfemoral. Uh, and so as a result, we are, we're doing very few transesophageal echoes um, for guidance at this point. So this has allowed us to move from general sedation to moderate sedation, essentially. So now the vast majority of our, our practice is transfemoral moderate sedation uh, TAVRs that are guided by transthoracic imaging. Um, so what, what the other interesting thing thing that's kind of come along the last seven, 10 years is this procedure has really been refined. I mean, the, our understanding of sizing um, and deploying the valve coaxially, um, the, the successive iterations of devices have all gotten better to the point where our complications are much lower and the risk of paravalvular regurgitation has gone from probably what was close to 10% early on, you know, significant paravalvular regurgitation, probably 10% early on with first generation devices and early experience now to more like maybe 1%, um, which is just amazing. Um, and so we've seen the whole procedure streamline so much where in the early experience, it was maybe one or two TAVRs would take a good portion of the day to just really being able to move efficiently um, through TAVR procedures with um, the minimally invasive or, or less invasive approach. That is amazing. When you think about AR was 10% of our patients and now it's only 1%. And, and yeah. even when we do see AR, it doesn't seem like it's as much as it used to be either. Yeah, I that's right. That's yeah. Definitely the sizing has, has improved as well as the technology about the valves. Um, I was wondering, you had mentioned the alternative approaches such as transapical, subclavian, et cetera. Can you give us, can you give the audience an idea of how, what percentage are now uh, transfemoral versus uh, one of the alternative uh, access sites and what makes that determination? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I don't have the data in front of me, but my sense is it's very small number are alternative access. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I can recall in the last several weeks, you know, maybe one case that was alternative access. Um, the, the vast majority are transfemoral. And I, that, that's primarily based on vascular access. So if, and, and I think that, that our, our ability to go transfemoral 
has been greatly enhanced by the smaller delivery sheaths and catheters that have been developed, but also kind of increased comfort with um, managing uh, managing vascular uh, femoral vascular disease and and other um, uh, potential therapies to get through calcified vessels. Um, so I don't have the exact numbers, but it, it it's very low the number yeah, that, that as, go to alternative access. As you know, I'm in this practice as well, and I that's by my experience. I can't even think of the last time that I've uh, done one in the hybrid OR and done it like a transapical used to be really pretty common, and I haven't done one of those in several months. Yeah. So um, the CT scan, Taver CT scan to size the peripheral vasculature still becomes a big you know, important decision point. But as you pointed out, the delivery systems have gotten much smaller. So we have been able to uh, deliver these valves through smaller vasculature, vascular systems with less complications. I think that's the key there. Are there, um, you know, for those imagers in the audience that might be wondering, what are the key views that you as an interventional echocardiographer, I always think that's sort of a uh, paradoxical term, but anyway, <laughs> as I thought I was a non-invasive uh, cardiologist, <laughs> not an interventional echocardiographer, but anyway, what are those key views that you're obtaining and, um, you know, for the imaging post haver Because it's quick, right? You're going to have to get those images quickly and efficiently. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if, so our interventional colleagues and our surgical colleagues aren't famous for their patients. I think um, ours, fortunately, are fairly patient. Um, um, but I, so I think some of the key views are, I usually, we usually start parasternal initially, because I think to me, the biggest thing that I want to answer up front is, is the, the question of paravavular regurgitation. So often that's kind of the first place I'm looking. And then of course, I want to make sure that there's not a new pericardial effusion that could indicate either aortic root rupture or or perhaps trauma to the LV from a catheter or or, or a delivery system, and you can see all that in the parasternal. So typically, starting the parasternal, we'll we'll look for effusion very quickly and then move to the valve. And then the, at the valve level, we're looking at the valve position and whether it's expanded. You know, so if the valve position is 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 not right, or if the valve is underexpanded, that definitely increases the likelihood of paravalvular regurgitation. And so we're, we're definitely going to make sure that we're very thorough uh, there. Uh, so we look at the long axis, the short axis, and then we still use this sort of this clock face uh, looking at paravalvular regurgitation. Again, the important thing is you have to have, if you're scanning or the sonographer scanning, you have to tip down to the skirt level. So you want to look at that for paravalvular regurgitation at the ventricular edge of that stent. Because if you're, if you're imaging right through the stent frame, you're going to miss paravalvular regurgitation because of acoustic shadowing from both the calcium of the native valve and the stent frame. So that's pretty key. You got to tilt down and, and do some sweeping views. Um, and then after that, we'll typically move to the apex and we'll do the apical views and we'll sweep through the valve again, looking for paravalvular regurgitation in multiple views. Uh, and then also checking a transvalvular gradient uh, uh, from the apical views. So, but one of the keys is you want to make sure that you see posterior because with, with, surface imaging, obviously you're imaging from an anterior perspective, there's, there's a chance you're going to miss posterior leakage um, because of acoustic shadowing. So you really want to make sure that you, you're extra attentive to that posterior part of the stent frame where you can miss paravalvular regurgitation. Obviously, if you're doing transesophageal imaging, it's the opposite because you're coming from a posterior perspective, you want to make sure you image anterior. Those are good points that you like to start really quickly to make sure there's no really concerning complication with looking for the effusion parasternally and then quickly look at the valve position. You also then go to the apex and look posteriorly, particularly for that shadowing because you get that from the anterior view. And then of course, looking for the gradient, which you probably most of the time, at least in that cath lab, although we teach all of our sonographers in the, in the outpatient labs to look at multiple different planes, it's a little bit more limited when we're in the cath lab. That's right. One of the things um, you didn't mention, but I think you probably also are looking for some any complications along the mitral valve, right? Because if the right. the aortic if the aortic skirt is too low, it could impair the mitral valve function. That's right. Can you speak to that just quickly, or 
Yep, that's definitely one of the things as well that we're looking at. Um, that's probably less less common, but definitely can happen. Um, so if the valve in particular is too low, and it 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 it, uh, it impinges on the anterior leaflet, it can cause leakage of the valve. Um, it's a new, It's been reported uh, mitral stenosis as well, but I think that's less common, mm -hmm. but definitely. Great. Um, do you ever? use any other or need any other imaging besides transthoracic for cavern guidance in this day and age? Yeah, so there, of course, there's the occasional patient that has a suboptimal acoustic windows, right? So patients, obese patients, patients with lung disease, it can certainly be much more challenging. Um, in some of those patients, um, we've also found, I believe it or not, the subcostal window can be helpful. Mm -hmm. So I've had several cases where really the subcostal window was what kind of saved us with transthoracic. We weren't able to see in the other windows as well, but then in the subcostal window, you can typically see sort of a, a, a long axis, but, but very frequently you can see a short axis as well. So I should add, that's one other window we will use when the other windows are difficult. But then if we can't see what we need to see, then I think the key is having, you know, uh, having a, a conversation with an interventional cardiologist and the surgeon in the room about what other imaging can be done. And so sometimes that may be uh, inserting a transesophageal probe. And so I think, um, and, and so obviously the anesthesia folks have to have uh, have to be part of that conversation too, because that changes the, the approach to anesthesia. So I think in some cases where you can't see uh, transesophageal echo can be certainly be helpful. Um, alternatively, if there's not concern for renal dysfunction, what we have sometimes done is an aortic root injection. Uh, so uh, an, an aortic angiogram can be helpful because typically we, we can see almost everything in, in, in the vast majority of patients, for instance, we can, you know, even if the images are tough, we can still often tell if there's a pericardial effusion, we can get a gradient, we can get some of the important pieces, but often what we're missing is the paravivular regurgitation piece. If the image suffers, that seems to be the first thing that suffers. And so then what we'll sometimes do is an aortic root injection, look for aortic regurgitation. If that looks great, then, uh, then we're done actually. Uh, we've sort of gathered all the information we need and we know that the, the, the result was successful. If there's, if it's still equivocal, you know, we're not sure after the aortic root angiogram, then you probably just need to put down a transesophageal echo probe to look. Well, that's great. And what are, what are the, um, what kind of gradients are you seeing in these tabbies and tavers after you, you finish the procedure? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so I will say that the, the, typically the gradient that we capture in the cath lab is typically lower than what we see uh, post, uh, you know, it, whether that's a dismissal or a 30 day echo. Um, and I think there, there's a couple of reasons for that. It probably has to do partly with sedation and then the, the, our ability to align with the, with the valve, probably the Doppler alignment is probably suboptimal in the cath lab. So um, I would say in, when we're in the cath lab, we're often seeing gradients sort of in the range of, you know, maybe three to seven, you know, for typical valves. I, uh, that's just sort of my gestalt. But mm -hmm. uh, and on follow-up, the, the valve gradients are typically in the range of, you know, anywhere from five to, to 12 or 13, I would say was a typical range. Um, Still amazingly good gradients on these valves. It, and it, it, um, yep. I think, you know, we, those people who might be listening to this, who don't typically image in the cath lab, would shudder to think, you know, here we have a patient flat on their back, oftentimes a camera hovering right over our hand as we're trying to, you know, manipulate the probe. The patient's not going to lay on their left side and you can't get a right peristernal most, most of the time because of uh, the positioning of the patient. So best practice in the outpatient setting has been, you know, we're going to sample apex, you know, subcostal, right para, supersternal uh, notch, and maybe even supraclavicular, and, you know, looking at all the different angles for an aortic valve. And you yourself have published that, you know, the aging population, right para is oftentimes the highest gradient. So we, that one we're kind of very limited by in, in our current uh, TAVI population in the cath lab. Yeah, so that okay. explains why the gradients yeah. are going to be yeah. higher, you know, in that 30-day echo uh, compared to what we're getting, but what we're really looking for is we just don't want, so we really want to make sure that there's not significantly high gradients when we leave the cath lab. 
Yeah, agreed. I agree. All right. Well, that's a very thorough discussion. You know, that as we've matured the procedure, not only because of the technical advances in the in the valve and the smaller size of the catheters and the better imaging mm -hmm. that we do up front, that we can plan these procedures to be very minimally invasive using moderate sedation and transthoracic echo in most, uh, most cases. The pitfalls are that we can have some acoustic imaging or sorry, some acoustic shadowing with our imaging planes that we're currently using. We have to have a low threshold if we're really worried about it to slip a TEE probe in at the time of the procedure. Would you say that's fair? Absolutely. That's, or that's, uh, if there's no concern for renal, maybe <clears throat> a, a root, uh, you know, as an echocardiographer, I shudder to say this, but yeah, <laughs> a root angiogram. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. But, uh, but it's nice to sort that out while we're in the cath lab because we can uh, talk with our surgical and uh, interventional colleagues and maybe make some adjustments that can do another inflation if necessary, et cetera, um, to, uh, to uh, mitigate some of those uh, things right at the time of the procedure. So it's really been a fascinating and rapidly evolving uh, area of uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, I think that we've really opened up a whole new world and we're starting to see this, of course, these less invasive procedures transcaster procedures, which I'm sure will come to this uh, same series of uh, interview with the experts for mitral valves and maybe tricuspid valves down the road. So I appreciate your leadership in the area of uh, imaging in the cath lab and um, excellent work in structural heart disease. So thank you for being with us for interviews with the experts. Have a great day.